it's nice to see everyone again on a maskless but also almost faceless conference. <laughs> Looking forward to next to the next one with real faces, real people. Uh, I hope I can manage with this presentation. So this is going to be about asynchronous or post commit triggers or asynchronous post commit triggers. Um, this is roughly what this is going to be about some preliminaries then um a brief because we were talking about triggers so let's let's start with simple uh, regular triggers and then because it's actually about enterprise replication or a part of it we will mostly talk about that and uh, specifically about creating those post commit, commit triggers there some command syntax and then of course um a little bit about udrs because it is about udrs and then i have prepared a little demo let's see whether we can get to that so i am uh, andreas Legnes. my name i'm working in uh, informic support since uh, more than two decades now hardly believable I do splash a little bit, so I, I have ex extra fun with all things system downs or, or, of course, also avoiding system downs. And then uh, also as well, all things replication. So enterprise replication as well as HDR and newer technologies called Mac 11. And I'm also, uh, the author of a, a small set of support utilities, some of them even usable for non-support people. Um, we're going to talk about um, triggers. So you might think of, of data modifications, uh, triggering some, some activity. Yeah, and uh, we are going to talk about uh, a new flavor of this uh, different from the traditional SQL triggers. So I already mentioned it, it's a special case of enterprise application, which is uh, why I picked this topic and also enjoyed preparing this and exploring quite a few things. So let's start with a quick overview into traditional SQL triggers that probably everyone knows, especially the insert, update, or delete trigger. So insert, update, delete operations triggering other activity, maybe other insert, update, deletes, or modifications of the, the data being inserted, updated, deleted, or whatever. There also are uh, two other flavors. There are select triggers instead of triggers, which we are not going to cover uh, and, and, and which are not really relevant in this context. So traditional triggers always are part of, of a tail schema. So they, they belong to the schema and uh, you define them along with the, with the table. Um, they can a simple trigger can uh, simply execute an SQL statement, or if you want more logic in, in that trigger, you can execute, you can call a, a routine. You have that before, for each, after, um, those choices in the trigger action and so on. <clears throat> and you also have, well, you, you can have those triggers working in the same database or in a different database, you can even have them reach out to a remote server or whatever you can put into those UDRs. You even can reach outside of the database server if you want. Um, some downside of this, well, some, some more characteristic is such trigger, of course, always runs in the context of that triggering statement, so insert, update, delete, 
or actually the triggering operation that might be a subset of a statement um, with the consequence that it makes that statement or operation more costly and uh, also take longer. And a failure of anything within the trigger will impact back or might impact back on that triggering operation. So even that triggering operation might fail. And since we are also possibly running in a larger transaction, the same is of course true for that transaction. So all that trigger logic, as powerful as it as it can be, um, can impact back on your OLTP load. Still, from an application perspective, you would not sense anything. Maybe you would sense some performance penalty. Now, what if you could all have you could have all all those um, powerful uh, possibilities, but without that uh, those perils and the cost to your OLTP business. So that is why we call this new functionality or, or why it could be used for so-called post commit triggers. Or uh, if, if you want, you can, can also call them async triggers because uh, regular triggers are synchronous triggers. They're always uh, being executed synchronously with your DML. So with post committed uh, post commit triggers, we would be considering only committed modifications. So anything uncommitted or, or not going to be committed or, or rolling back would not even be uh, considered. And we would, of course, uh, also uh, only do that after the transaction compl completed. So no way of uh, impl implicating or impacting back on that transaction. Of course, in some context, uh, synchron synchronicity might be more important um, and performance may be not so important, but if though if, if it's if synchronicity can be uh, waived, then um, that's one one criteria for going for post commit triggers. Those modifications then would be sent into a UDR similar to triggers. So only the UDR option, no simple uh, SQL possible. And again, you could do there what you want. And um, in this case, since we are enterprise replication, you could do it anywhere you want. So post commit triggers, uh, also known as async triggers, a true version 14.10 feature should stop my right so um a quick comparison the regular triggers we already went over that are those fully synchronous then for uh some more confusion. We also ha have the smart triggers. They are slightly older than post commit triggers. They actually are a quite different beast, and uh, their main purpose is simply as the CDC that you might know is to provide um, modifications to external uh, consumers to an external uh, application and. We're not going to touch much on, on this today, and this is our post commit trigger subject, which in their result can be much like regular triggers. So any modification possible there. And uh, but essentially they are a UDR running somewhere and re receiving the, the modified data. And the implementation is simply yet another 
ER replicate type. So we will look a little bit into replicate uh, into ER enterprise replication in general. And since all this always happens post commit and asynchronous to your uh, real transactions, this is uh, why we are calling them post commit or async triggers. Or you might also find the term, well, you might find the term ER to SPL. Oh, sorry, that was, uh, I prefer calling it ERDR because that SPL tends to suggest some limitations. Use cases, the mandatory slide as uh, a slide, uh, slide on, on use cases. I, I think you are probably even better than myself in, in inventing those use cases or seeing them already. So you can um, aggregate your data to those uh, such as UDRs. You, so you, you can as do this kind of, of streaming or streaming an analytics on your data while, while it's being generated. You can transform your, your data while being sent somewhere or even in place. Uh, one, one, one special case of that would be uh, data normalization. You can even use this feature for pushing your data, the modifications or new newly inserted data to external data syncs like uh, graph databases, Hadoop, Spark, and so on. And one other nice uh, nicety of, of this feature is um, finally you can use ER techniques on data sets or, or on tables actually that don't have prime or a comparable unique index. Because this new feature, uh, even though based on ER does not rely and does not need uh, any such thing. So at this point, I think we, we need to stop pretending talking about anything SQL. We are actually talking enterprise replication. And uh, for the not quite familiar with enterprise replication, a very quick recap on what that is and what it can do. So enterprise replication uh, starts where your um, transactions ended. So they ended up in the logic logs, in the transaction logs, where enterprise replication would read them from and accumulate uh, all those modifications into the original transactions in the so-called grouper. We will have a picture on this uh, right after this, I think. Then those accumulated transactions will be evaluated uh, for first for their net change. So we, we call that grouper compression. And then uh, for what, which part of, of such transaction needs to be replicated and where to. All this uh, for, for every, um, well, actually for, for, for every table that you want to replicate is controlled through, through so-called replicates. You can call them replication rules. You define them per table, but you can, that the granularity of, of what, what you can detect defined to be uh, replicated can go down even to single individual columns and even sets of rows. So enterprise replication relies on a sufficient queuing system and uh, then those transactions or those parts that it determined to be uh, required for sending, still ask transactions to the respective destinations. And that can be anywhere within an ER domain that is 
a an arbitrary arbitrarily big set of informic servers uh, defined as enterprise replication servers. And eventually upon arrival, those transactions will be uh, applied to the target database target tables. All this is asynchronous in nature, still very, very, very well performing normally. So um, typically you would not even see a, a large delay. So it's very reliable, reliable recoverable and uh, tolerant against all kinds of odd outages. And it is, by the way, it's it's fully integrated. It is uh, part of of your on init binary, and so on. Here, uh, all only the minimum steps for defining an enterprise application server. So here, all this still in a in a quick graph. We have a source component and a target, or a source side and a target side, and and some components on each side. Of course, source and target would always coexist on the same server, but for a, for a specific set of data, uh, one server might be the source and another server the target. The transactions would go through the logic logs, be snooped, go into that grouper component I already mentioned, and then be put on the send queue. And there, it will remain for a while, even if it is immediately picked for being sent here through the network, network interface. So that that might be be sent immediately upon being queued here on the queue, but still it will remain on the queue. I'm emphasizing this uh, for a reason that, that I will uh, soon explain. Then it will, be received again into a queue and from there be finally be applied to the target database, target table and so on. And then once applied, an acknowledgement will be produced and put on a queue. Eventually those acknowledgements will be sent back to the sent queue and upon receiving of this ACK, only upon the receiving of this ACK, the transaction will be considered delivered. So, I mean, you can have even multiple of these targets. So, I must say, upon receival of all ACKs of all targets, our transaction finally will be considered delivered. The progress will be updated and only now we will forget about the transaction on this side. So whatever happens during this delivery process will not impact our ability to retransmit the, the, the transaction and to make sure that no matter what, the transactions will be delivered to the target database. So this is a very uh, reliable, very proven concept running in many, many places and causing fewer and fewer problems. So uh, I must say, I ha sometimes I'm missing the enterprise application cases because they are really becoming rare recently, or well, actually over a couple of years now. So now, uh, this traditional enterprise replication of course, still to mention, we have a uh, monitoring options in Onstat for this. And now this is the new thing. All this, with all this in place, why not allowing this data here, this, this last error here, instead of going to the target uh, table, uh, being sent into some sort of UDR. So with all this infrastructure guaranteeing all that rec recoverability and resilience against all kinds of, 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 of uh, trouble, we now have a way of executing a UDR, a random UDR 
or an arbitrary UDR, I must say, on, on your modifications. So here a quick recap on what a replicate is. Uh, it's, it's, in, in principle, it's, it's simply a, a written definition, a command that you execute. So through this CDR utility, where you define a replicate with a name, you have a set of options that I will not go into here now. But this is a pretty rich set of options too. And then you define all the tables in your server, various servers, in arbitrary databases, wherever you want them. And for each table, you say what list of columns you want to replicate. You standard, uh, the, 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 the standard way would simply be an, an asterisk here, of course. So if you want to replicate the whole table. And then you also can limit the replicate to only a set of rows in that table. There's one extra field uh, for the for for a mode where you can specify the role of so each each of these lines is called a participant in in the replicate. The whole thing is a replicate, and each slide, each of these lines in this uh, notification in this notation is called a participant. And for each participant, you can specify should it only receive modifications? So would it target? Should it only send out modifications and not receive anything? Or should it uh, with the letter being the default? And then you also even can uh, specify under which user the data will be applied on the target. So now, in with all this in place and and going to be used even for for what we are discussing now, what is new? Basically, only a set of defined replicate options, which is a an, a UDR name. The option uh, suggests SPL, but it actually can be any UDR. And there is a special, a, a, an alternative to this. So either you use SPL name or JSON SPL name, in which case that UDR would um, consume JSON rather than uh, regular um, SQL type parameters. And you can, optionally, you can uh, specify uh, the list of columns that you want to be passed into this UDR. So typically, by, or by default, that would be this column list. But for instance, if you specify an asterisk here, then you can say, you can uh, further specify the column list here. And for a um, reason I will mention later, we also have a new cascade replicate option. Yeah, we will get to that, I think. So all this is only available in defined replicate and not in modified replicate. The reason for this is uh, you can, so you a replicate is either a traditional replicate or an ER to SPL replicate. Well, actually, the main reason, and one consequence of this, of course, is that you, for instance, not uh, alter the UD, UDR name here. You would have to delete and recreate the replicate if you wanted to use a different UDR. But um, yeah, you cannot mix the regular replication with um, this ERTL replication in a single replicate. So here's a quick replicate, uh, a quick example. Um, but that looks very similar. Uh, I, I specified 
this minus C always because that is really mandatory. And then these are the new options. I specified my tab, uh, so the, the, the post commit trigger UDR for my table, my tab PCT UDR, and I only want those three columns to be treated, processed by my UDR. Um, despite this, uh, Example suggesting only two participants. In reality, you can again have any number of participants here. Uh, well, one, one thing here is I specified the P, so that would be send and receive, and here receive only. So that together, this clearly defines a one way replication. You could also have this both ways, or if you have multiple um, participants, you carry, can have it n ways. So every every participant sending their modifications to all the other participants. So uh, you might now wonder: Well, we are not sending anything, we are not replicating between tables. We are replicating between a table and UDR. So why do I have to specify all these tables? So one reason already is that if you if you do uh, update anywhere replication, so from all sites, then you would, would all, of course need those tables everywhere. But then even in a, a unidirectional case, this target table definition here, or actually the schema of the table at the location where that UDR is being executed will be used for determining uh, the signature of the UDR that we are going to call. So we already mentioned no need for primary key because we, we, we don't apply anything to a target table. So we don't have to identify any rows in the target tables, which was which, which is the, the, the only reason why we need a primary key in enterprise application. Any number of participants, of course, below two does not make any sense. That target table schema is required, the table can be empty and in most cases might remain empty. So the, the only purpose of that target table is to provide the, um, the column types uh, for the UDR that, that will be called. You cannot mix regular and, and ER to UDR replicates or replication within one replicate, I think. You, you can, of course, have regular enterprise replication running with a lot of regular replicates, and uh, those ER to UDR replicates uh, side by side. In, in that case where you already are using enterprise replication, so one, um, one restriction when using enterprise replication is that any modifications driving through replication on from server A to server B will not be eligible for uh, being picked up by replication again. So if you wanted to also include those modifications arriving from a different server through ER, uh, in your post commit trigger processing. Then you would have, then one, one option would be to use this new cascade replicate option. This will flag all modifications all uh, coming in via ER to be uh, eligible for being snooped by the ER snooper again. So this, you use this, option when defining a new replicate 
but it actually will affect the traffic coming in via other replicates for, for that particular table that you are defining the replicate on. We already mentioned uh, one-way, two-way, multi-directional. And say as uh, for regular replication where you can specify as which user the data should be applied to the target table, this same option now can decide as which user under which user ID the UDR would run, if that should be of any relevance to you. There are um, there are a, a, a set of uh, replicate options. I already mentioned them. I'm not going to show all of them here. One of them is mandatory with every replicate. That is the minus C option. You have to specify what conflict resolution you want to have or, or none at all. Uh, with this new type of replicates, there cannot be any conflicts. So this is um, maybe while well, I, I said here it is for legacy reasons, I think we could even suppress this, this necessity. Maybe maybe a future version will, will do that. So this is actually not uh, serving any purpose, but still it needs to be specified. Then another option that might be interesting, especially if you think about um, fail, failure cases, UDR failures, and if your transactions that uh, you would send into such post-commit triggers are comprised or, or can be comprised of multiple rows. So not only singleton insert update delete transactions, but possibly more complex transactions whose various uh, parts for, for maybe for different tables um will be uh, somehow dealt with by by enterprise application so in that case you have to think about what should happen in the event of a failure and that applies to regular uh, transactions uh, regular replication as well as as this new type of replication so you would define what should happen in case of a failure should the whole transaction fail or should only that row that, that incurs the failure fail and the rest of the transaction is allowed to apply. And you don't care whether that transaction is fully applied on, on the target. Uh, the minus A minus R options are very much recommended because without, without uh, they, they, they specify that you want to see so-called aborted transaction or, or raw information spooling files in case of failure. So only in case of failure, these, these are relevant. They won't do anything. They won't cost you anything otherwise. But in case of failure, this really is the only way for learning which data, which transactions actually failed. Otherwise, you might get a message in, in the message log. Sometimes you don't even get such message. But you would not learn, and even in that message, you would not learn which transactions with which rows, which tables are affected, and so on. All this information would be in those ATS risk files that you enable with these options. Cascade Apple, I already mentioned. As, of course, a good deal of other options. I think most of them are not very relevant. Some of them might. There is, for instance, a um, ignore delete option. Well, yeah, you you might have your own opinion on this. Now, what needs to be said about uh, UDRs? 
As I said, it doesn't need to be SPL only. It can also be C or Java UDRs. So documentation as well as uh, those CDFR defined replicate option names might be a little bit misleading. And of course, for those who already worked with C or Java UDRs, they will know what, what all is possible. And well, you can put a whole slew of, of logic, even uh, whole application logic into the database server this way. And with post commit triggers, it would not um, impact, implicate your OLTP business because it would run afterwards asynchronously and maybe even on a separate database server instance if you choose to do so. A separate instance does not even have to have access to that data in your database, whatever you, you need. So that UDR is on any in any target database. It does not have to exist on the on a pure source. It is not checked at uh, defined replicate time. And if it if it does not exist, you would or if it, yeah or, or if it cannot be resolved, then you would just see. Uh, CDRD apply errors. And um, one good thing about the UDR, the, its existence not being checked, is that you can replace the UDR at any time. So you can play with your UDR and update it and don't have to uh, recreate it every time again. So uh, recreating implies that there's always a short period where you have to delete it and might miss actions. So uh, figuring out the precise UDR signature can be a little bit of a, of a hassle, but you will get used to that. And of course, um, as with traditional replication, uh, Target apply failure would be considered a failure, and and so those uh, those that that data would be lost, and or would at least uh, may, maybe it would be written into those ATS risk files. Um, in this case, UDR failure would be reported back, and but um, that would be treated similar to to target table apply. It will still be considered delivered from the perspective of the enterprise application source. And if you want to catch the data that, that failed to apply, then you would have to enable ATS RIS now. One more aspect. Um, I keep talking about transactions, but what the UDR actually receives, we will see this in the next slide, only are insert update deletes. So the, the UDR is not immediately aware of transaction boundaries. You would not see a begin or commit. And what you, what you would see is a transaction ID. And uh, if you keep track of the transaction ID, then you can determine this is a new one. So this must be a new transaction but you would not really learn about the end of a transaction. So that is at the moment at least not possible. So there are two flavors for specifying the UDR, either the JSON format or the non-JSON format. And here you learn what all data that UDR will receive. So that will be the operation type, of course, insert, update, or delete in the form of a single character. Then the source server ID, that will be interesting. If you have multiple 
servers using this type of replication. You will learn the exact wall clock time, commit wall clock time on the source system and a transaction ID, a big in transaction ID, which is unique to that source system so that the combination of source ID and source system will uniquely identify the transaction. The transaction ID, we will see this on the next slide, is, is simply the combination of log unique ID and OS. So something that that enterprise application is also working heavily with. Uh, new in, in the latest release in XC6 is that we now also pass in a user ID, the user ID and the session ID of the original transaction. For auditing purpose, I think this, this got added. And then eventually, uh, of course, uh, you will get the data that. So that would be those columns that you specified in that minus SPL calls uh, option or uh, the columns in you in the select projection list. Normally for insets and deletes, only this list will be populated. For updates, you will see uh, the before values in this list and the after values in this list. Andreas, this is your uh, 10 minute warning. Oh, 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 so no demos. That is already clear by now. Okay, so uh, the UDR can return a value, but that will not serve any purpose. So don't don't use a return code for flagging any failure or, or success. If you want to deal with failure, then you have to raise an exception. Uh, one quick warning that we learned in a different context, but that, that is uh, related to this one. Um, certain locales might have a problem with, with these decimal float money types uh, because, it, because their usage of the comma sign. So that will, would confuse the internal uh, creation of that UDR call and cause ugly 674 errors. And, and these, uh, these errors are really hard to diagnose. So uh, we are working on a way to, to improve that. But yeah, next fix pack will have this ugly defect fixed. Here's a sample UDR. Well, I, uh, I think I will not go into a lot of detail here. Let's skip over this. I did some, yeah, I think you will, you can look at this in the slides data. Then very quick on the JSON flavor of the UDR. I'm not a JavaScript person, so I would not even know what to do with it. But for those uh, working with JSON, this might be handy. I think this is not meant for uh, processing the data much within the database server because we are converting the, the SQL data into JSON uh, for then processing it in SQL again. That's probably not making a lot of sense. But there is a way for, uh, for uh, getting all that content, uh, almost all that content that the previous slides showed in JSON format. Instead of source server ID, you would get DB owner table information. So for external consumption, that might be more interesting. And beyond that, it's pretty much the same data, only in JSON format. And there was, a, a, again, a slight problem fixed in XC7 with quotes within string values. So here's a sample of, of, of such a JSON parameter. The, the, the whole UDR only has a single parameter, a big JSON document that will contain all this. Oh, this is 
this needs to be corrected. I'll do that later. Ah, and here again, what the transaction ID is. I mentioned that already. It's just lock unique ID and lock position. Of course, um, the UDR is running in the context of an enterprise repl replication target transaction. And so you, you would have multiple of these UDR invocations if the transaction comprises multiple rows. And um, you can, of course, not use begin commit rollback there because that really would confuse the would confuse enterprise application. If you need uh, some control about what should happen in the event of a failure, then you can use save points instead. I already mentioned the minus S, the, the scope option for what, what should happen in case of a failure, either a transaction rollback or a transaction allowed to continue on and only row fails and do use ATS risk files. Um, yep, this is a little more on UDR failure, which uh, you either want to catch. So uh, any SQL you're doing in your UDR or SPL, of course, potentially can fail and you might want to catch that, or you might, you might even want to um, introduce your own exceptions. All this is possible in this UDRs. And um, any exception not caught or, or yeah, not handled will cause the UDR to fail and we're a little weak at uh, diagnosing these things. I, I would say maybe we can improve here a little. So what you would learn uh, about this only is the SQL and the ISOM codes, or maybe the, the, those codes, the, 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 the code that you specified here. You would not learn any message text, and you would only learn those in ATS risk files. So that can be a little tedious uh, if you incur problems. And that of course applies for uh, self-created exceptions as well as ones that you occur otherwise. Uh, there's a, a little more uh, a little further tidbit. Uh, you might know that with regular enterprise applications, certain failures, certain apply failures for the target tables are retriable, and ER would uh, retry the target apply up to twice, so on the whole three times. If you know these error codes, I, I wrote them here, then you could even get these this retry activity in in your UDRs. So you would have to raise this this ISOM error here, <clears throat> and then uh, you could get uh, the UDR re-invoked up to two times. Now we. We're starting with simple triggers, which um, might only meant, uh, have, have been meant uh, to do some, log uh, some, some local logic in your local database, maybe even the same table, maybe even just modify the row that, that got modified further. So, so we might not even want to think uh, towards other servers, other databases, other tables. That also is possible. So you can even do this locally using uh, combi combining this new feature with the uh, new 
loopback replication, well, not so new loopback replication. We have it since version 12.10 XC11. So I'll quickly skip over this. Well, what is loopback replication? It's, it's simply one way to replicate, to use enterprise replication techniques within a single database server, within a single instance, and even within the same database, or maybe even uh, on the same table. So you can use this. I think I'm already close to the end anyway. Yeah, we're we're we've pretty much run out of time. Can you wrap up? Yeah. So, yeah, just just let me let me uh, end on on the point that all this is also possible locally on a single instance. So if you hadn't hadn't uh, been using ER so far, you would only define ER on that single server, and even in a larger enterprise application domain. You could still use it only locally on, on each server because every each and every enterprise server can also replicate locally uh, using that pseudo local loopback uh, extra server. Right. So should we still open up for question here or oh, there are there, 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 there are a couple of questions in the chat. Let me let me run them by you and see if we can get a couple done. Quickly. Um, yes, I would uh, love to. Vicente Salvador asks Is there some kind of timeout if the UDR takes too long to digest the data? Will it compromise or affect ER? Um, since we are asynchronous, um, it would not affect ER. I mean, if, if everything takes long persistently, then that would. Uh, might might cause a, a some sort of backlog, but I, what I did not mention anywhere is you can uh, that that target apply can be highly parallelized. So you can have uh, a large number of those target apply th threads running in, par in parallel, and all the ER apply parallelism would apply if you don't exclude this, it would apply uh, also for this uh, post commit trigger thing. So that already could help a little bit this. And no, there is no timeout. So the target apply never, uh, I mean, the, the only the only situation where you could run on a timeout is is waiting on a lock. So okay. there's, there is beyond, beyond that. And, and there the CDR lock timeout configuration would apply just as well. Great, thank you. Um, the other question we have is to verify that the procedure is being executed on the target server. Can you repeat that? Sure, the, the question was whether the procedure is executing on the target server or the source. Only on the target, so that, that okay. is target apply activity. Okay, I think that's the only question. And it also really only have. needs to exist there. Um, but of course, that target server can be your local server if you use if you're using loopback application. Right, right. All right. Thank you very much. It was a very comprehensive presentation. And thank you all for coming. I thank you too. All right. The next session starts in about ten minutes. Thank you, everybody.